Well, let me let me introduce you. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Prattle. He's uh, Michael is a full professor of computer science at the University of Stuttgart. He has gone from strength to strength in his career, gathering momentum along the way, winning, among other awards, three distinguished uh, ACM Distinguished Paper Awards in the last two years. Um, his work is increasingly both raising the bar and setting the research agenda in software engineering, especially as software engineering adopts and adapts to AI-powered tooling. Uh, he's going to sh shed light on a modern mystery in this talk. Just how do attentional neural networks work so well by comparing their attention to human attention on the same task, method summarization? Michael. Yeah, thanks for the really nice introduction. I need to learn from that. <laughs> so yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about some work that was done jointly with my PhD student, Matteo Paltengi. Um, and the title is Thinking Like a Developer, um, where we are comparing the attention of humans with neural models of code. Um, so my, my very first slide um, probably isn't very shocking to anyone who's, who's here in, the, in this meetup. So it's um, about this whole trend that I like to call neural software analysis, where the basic idea is that you can learn developer tools from, from large software corpora. And um, as you're here, you're probably aware of um, um, the fact that this is possible and also have lots of ideas how this works, but the, the really um, uh, high level view is that you have some kind of machine learning model that gets as its input um, source code or maybe some other information that you may have about um, a program such as execution traces or documentation or bug reports or anything else you um, have that is associated with a particular program. And then um, a model learns some sort of predictive tool. And this, this overall pattern has been applied to many different tasks over the past few years, um, things like type prediction, bug detection, um, automated program repair, code completion, and many other tasks that, um, yeah, I don't have to list all, but what you're probably aware of. Um, and then of course, once you have this predictive tool, you can query it with um, some new code or maybe some new execution, and then hopefully get some information out of it that is useful um, to developers. Now this works really well, and we could just say, yeah, let's celebrate, um, it works, we're all happy. Um, but sometimes um, people uh, are wondering, and we were wondering in particular, what these models are actually learning. Because if you work on these models, it, it often feels a bit like you're a magician, right? You, you change something here, you change something there, and then suddenly it works and you don't fully understand um, why, um, which is um, yeah, bad for two reasons. One is that it's, um, of course, intellectually unsatisfying. As researchers, we would like to understand why something works and not just get it to work. And it's also um, possibly bad because there's a risk that the models are just coincidentally appearing to work because they overfit to some property of your of your data or maybe pick up something that they shouldn't actually learn. Um, and of course, this is something you you would like to find out. Now, I do not have um, a full answer to this to this really big challenge of understanding how neural models work, but um, yeah, we've taken a first step into um, into yeah this direction by basically um, implementing a relatively simple idea, which is to compare humans and learned models on exactly the same task, giving them exactly the same code examples, and then comparing how they, how they perform and, and, and how they actually solve this task. So we have this kind of human versus machine kind of setup um, where we look at two tasks, I'll introduce them in, in a second, and then um, in order to understand what the models and what humans are, are, are focusing on to, in order to solve the task, we measure the attention that the models are paying and that the developers are paying. We'll see how this works. Um, for the models, you can probably guess that we are um, using the attention mechanism and for the developers, I'll show you in a minute how this works. And then we measure a couple of other things, of course, also um, including the effectiveness so that we can compare um, the developers and um, the machine learning models and see how they actually yeah, compare in terms of effectiveness. So let me start by um, explaining our methodology. Um, and then afterwards, I will go through some of the results and some of the um, yeah, takeaways um, we get from them. So first we need to pick a task. And actually in this work, um, we have two tasks that we've looked at so far. And the first one is code summarization. So it's this um, relatively early task that people have been working on for a while now, which takes a piece of code as an input and then produces um, some natural language description of what the code is doing as an output. And in particular in the setup, um, the input is the body of a method um, uh, of some Java class. 
and the output should be the method name um, that this um, yeah, method body um, should, should have, or at least one reasonable name that the method body should have. Um, so you see an example here where we have some code and then the predicted method name should, for example, be update state. Um, yes. Sorry, Michael, just to jump in, I can still see the neural software analysis slide. Oh, really? That's yes. what, what you should see. There we go. <laughs> Is that the case for everyone or just, just you? It was, it was the, the case here. for me as well. Same um, for me here. Did, did you miss a couple slides? Like, were, have we missed a number of slide updates, Michael? Yes. <laughs> would you mind? Would you mind backing up and like, because I just yeah, thought yeah, you, I know, I know. If you okay, I, I I can say again what I said, but let's make sure you now see. Don't, what you, you don't need to say it all over again, but you could just yeah, like yeah, yeah, I, can, I can, can. So so can you can you see a different slide now? No, we can't. So it's still on the. And there we go. Now we can see. Now, what are these actually? What are these? Yeah. What are these models actually learning? We see it that yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's the one you should which, see. <laughs> which is a cool Bruegel. It looks like a Bruegel painting. Uh, hmm. Embarrassingly, I do not know who <laughs> who painted this painting, but um, yeah, I, I I was I was googling for alchemist, and that's what I found. <laughs> Yeah. So, so yeah. Just to 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 recap briefly what I already said. So, so the idea is that we do not really understand how these models work, and sometimes it feels like you're one of these old alchemists um, because you you turn a few knobs here and there, and suddenly it works. But but we don't fully understand what the what the models are doing. I'm now moving on to a different slide, and you should see now something entitled "Idea Compare Humans and Models." Do you? No, we don't. I I, I, I still see the alchemist. Hmm. Uh, here. Weird. Okay. Yeah. Now now I, I see it. Okay. I so think it only updates during the alt tab for some reason. So there's something odd with the uh, window capture. The alt tab? So if it's switch between windows basically? Yes. Yeah, so when you switch between windows, it does update. But then as soon as you're within the app itself and change slides, it doesn't. Interesting. Okay. Then I'll try to remember to switch windows whenever <laughs> I switch a slide. Good exercise. <laughs> okay, so the, 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 the idea we had to compare um, or to understand what these uh, neural models of code are doing is to, to compare them um, directly to human developers who are, who are acting on the same task. So that the humans get the same task, get to see the same code examples, and then we look into the attention paid by the developers and by the models in order to understand um, what they are doing. Now, you could do this for, for many different tasks. And I'm now on task one code summarization. Can you see that? Yes, OK. Um, so we looked into two tasks here. And the first one is code summarization, where the input to the model is uh, the body of a Java method, like the code that you can see here. And the output is supposed to be the name of the method. So a very short natural language description of what this code is doing. It's one of the tasks that yeah, people have looked at um, relatively early on when this field was just emerging. And we um, use a data set here that was proposed in one of the earlier papers um, where we use 250 methods from Java projects. And the, the crown truth is the actual name that the, the methods have. We also look at a second task, um, namely program repair. Um, and specifically the setup here is the following. So we um, give the model um, um, a buggy uh, piece of code, a, a method that is buggy. Again, it's Java. And we assume that we have some fault localization technique that tells us which line in this code is, is the buggy one. And then the output that the model should produce is a fixed version of this line. So it may be a completely rewritten version of the line or more or less the same line with, with some tiny change, whatever is needed in order to, to fix the bug. And the data set we are using um, is um, from the QuickSparks data set where we focus on single line bugs. So we basically make sure that um, um, yeah, the data set fits this um, setup that we that we're using here. So now we have these two tasks. And now the goal is to compare how humans and how neural models are addressing these tasks. And in order to do this, we need some way to um, capture the um, attention of humans and of models. And just to double check, are you now seeing a slide capturing human attention? You do? Okay, good. I'm really good at switching windows. Um, so in order to track the attention of humans, um, we came up with a new web-based interface that basically allows you to either just look at some code or edit some code while having to um, 
unblur the code that you want to look at. Um, it's it's not a convenient way to program or to to inspect code. Um, that's not really the purpose, but is it's it's a way to um, to perform these tasks where we can measure what code you're most likely looking at simply because you're unblurring it. So initially, when when people start working on on the task, everything is blurred, so they just see that there is code somewhere and 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 they can maybe guess um, something like indentation levels but they don't really see the details they can't really read the code and then you can move your mouse or also your cursor over the code and by doing this you unblur individual tokens um, and and by doing this we can capture which tokens are unblurred for what amount of time and can you use that as a proxy to measure the attention that um, people are are spending so let me um, show you a concrete example of how this looks like. So um, this is a screenshot of the interface we used for code summarization. So the white part is basically the code part. And as you can see, um, if the mouse is uh, moved over some token, then this token and also um, uh, three neighboring tokens or subtokens to the left and right are unblurred. And then um, once the developer has has moved the mouse often enough and has gotten an understanding of the of the meaning of this code, um, he or she can choose on the on the left um, what the name of this um, a piece of code should be. So, so this is the, the setup we are using. Um, we, we, we gave this um, interface to 91 participants and got around 1,500 um, uh, unique human attention records from, the, from them. So it's, it's quite a good um, data set to um, yeah, understand how the humans pay attention for this code summarization task. Why not use eye tracking? Oh, good question. Why not eye tracking? Uh, we could have used eye tracking. Um, the, at least two answers why we did not. One is it was during the pandemic, so it was ah. a lot easier to actually do this um, remotely. But even if there's no pandemic, I think it's 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 actually yeah. easier to run it like this because people do not have to come to a particular place. They do not need to need to use a particular setup um, in order to 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 perform the eye tracking. And there have been some studies, not on code but on on images, that show that. Um, what you measure with eye tracking and what you measure using using this kind of unblurring based interface is is more or less the same. So I think um, okay. it's as valid as eye tracking is to to capture the attention. Thanks. But, yeah, very good question. All right. So for program repair, um, we have a similar interface, just with um, less aggressive colors and and some other minor changes, um, which you can see now. Um, so again, there's a code editor, which is the white part. Um, uh, actually, in contrast to what we had for code summarization, it is an editor now, so you can not just see the code, but you can actually edit it um, as you as you can in every in every IDE. Um, but again, we use this unblurring feature. So by moving the mouse or moving the, moving the cursor, um, you can decide which parts of the code you are seeing, so that we can keep track of um, yeah what parts of the code you're actually looking at. Um, yeah, we have um, a slightly smaller data set here, so it's only 27 participants and 98 um, bug fixing records. And the reason why it's a smaller data set is simply that the task is more difficult. So on average, people take a couple of minutes. We, we had a timeout of 15 minutes to actually find out what the bug is and to fix it. So um, yeah, because we, we can't really um, uh, yeah, spend too much participant time on, on this kind of task in practice, um, we had to limit the number of participants a bit. Good, so what we get out of this um, is something like that. So it's basically an attention map, similar to what you may have seen when you look at attention maps of models, just that now this attention map is not created by a model, but it's, it is created by um, a human and tells us what part of the code um, people look at in order to, to solve either the code summarization or the program repair task. Um, the attention maps that we use at the end are averaged over all the participants that have looked at the same um, piece of code so that we get yeah, an idea of what people in general look at and not just one individual. All right, so this is how we capture the attention of, um, of humans. Um, of course, we also need to look at the attention of models. And to do this, we um, yeah, used a couple of models, um, two for code summarization and two for program repair, which are listed here. 
Um, and um, as many of these models actually have two kinds of attention mechanism um, that they use, we make use um, of these two um, different kinds of attention mechanisms. So there in all models is um, just a regular um, uh, self-attention mechanism, um, which, which we use. And then in three out of the four models, there also is um, a copy mechanism that is based on attention, which basically allows the model to copy individual tokens from the input directly to the output. And the copy attention is basically helping the model to decide which tokens to copy. So this gives us an idea um, which tokens the model considers as good candidates to be eventually copied to the output. All right, so let's now have a look at um, some of our results. Um, and as a first uh, result, let's have a look at um, how we actually measure to what extent um, um, the model and the humans agree. So we somehow have these, these attention maps that we get from the humans and the attention maps that we get from the, from the models. And now we need to somehow tell how, um, how much they agree um, with each other. So what we, what we do here is to compare these attention vectors, um, um, H the one from the model, uh, from the human and M the one from the model. And in order to compare them, we use um, a Spearman rank correlation, which is essentially a measure of agreement between um, ranked lists. So we, we, we basically check um, whether the human and the model agree on what is the most important token or the least important token and, and also all the other tokens in between. And um, this rank cor correlation then gives us a, a value between um, minus one and one, where one means perfect agreement and minus one means uh, complete disagreement. So using this um, this metric, um, uh, let's have a look at the, at the results we are getting. So what you see now um, are the results um, from code summarization, where we just compare humans with humans. So this is not really helpful to compare um, or to understand what the models are doing, but it's more to establish a baseline and to see to what extent humans actually agree with each other, what parts of the code are important or, or unimportant. So the way you can read this, um, this plot, and you'll see a few more of those on the next few slides, is that um, each of these bars um, is uh, some, uh, some number of uh, code examples. And um, if, more, if, if, if the weight of this distribution is more toward the right, there's a higher agreement. Um, in this case, we have a mean agreement of uh, 0 0.59, which means it's relatively high. Um, and that basically means that developers mostly agree on what code um, matters most for this for the summarization task. Um, let's now not just look at humans, but also look at um, the um, at the models. Um, and let's start again with the with the code summarization task, um, where you can now see um, the humans compared to the copy attention that the models are um, are paying. And you see the, the, well, one of the two models, the one that is based on CNNs on the top and the other model, the one that is based on transformers um, at, the, at the bottom. And again, what you see is that um, there's relatively high um, um, agreement between the humans and the models, what to copy directly. So which tokens to copy directly to the output, um, which is good to see because it essentially gives you an empirical justification for this idea of copy attention and its use for this particular task. Because it basically means, yep, this is similar to what the humans are doing. They also look at particular tokens in order to decide that those tokens should be part of the method name, and the models are, are doing it very similarly. So this is this is good news um, in terms of yeah, understanding that the models actually do what what we believe they they are doing. Um, now the picture changes a bit if we look at um, at regular attention. So now this is um, again the same two models um, for code summarization, but we look at uh, the regular self-attention that the models are paying. And what you see is, um, yeah, is that there's a lot of room for improvement, at least if the goal is to, to make the models um, look at the same kinds of tokens um, as the humans look at. Um, so for the, for the CNN-based model, you see that um, there are some, some pieces of code and some tokens for which there is some attention, but there also is quite a bit of this distribution um, um, between zero uh, yeah, and, and minus one, so on the negative side. And for the second model, the transformer-based model, it's actually even worse. So there is um, mostly disagreement on what to look at. So the models um, pay attention to very different tokens than, than the humans. Um, now, this is interesting, but of course you wanna um, know what kinds of 
um, models, uh, sorry, what kinds of tokens um, the disagreement is about, which is, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll get there in a second, but, but let me first uh, jump to the, to the, second, um, to the second task, uh, program repair. And again, um, we first look at human-human agreement and then look at human model um, agreement. And um, similar to what we've seen for code summarization, um, the humans mostly agree on, on what code matters most. So again, the, the mean agreement here is, or the mean Spearman uh, rank coefficient is um, above um, 0 0.5, 0 0.56. Um, so, so the humans mostly agree on what is important. Um, and now for the models. Um, it uh, looks better than it looked for code summarization, but still not as good as the human-human agreement. So for the first model that we look at here, uh, Recoder, um, the mean agreement is uh, 44%. And for the second model, Sequencer, it's um, 35%. So, so if, if the goal is to make the models more similar to the humans, then there still is some room for improvement, but it's, the situation is not as, um, as um, yeah, um, surprising maybe as for the code summarization models. All right, so now the question I already um, hinted at um, is, is, not of is, is, is now, of course, um, what kinds of uh, tokens do the humans focus on and do the, do the models focus on and where are the differences, right? So we do not just want to understand whether they agree or not. We want to understand um, uh, in particular how they, how they differ from each other. And to, to answer that question, um, we looked at what kinds of tokens um, uh, either humans or models focus on. And we distinguish different kinds of tokens, in particular identifiers, separators, and the other kinds of programming language tokens that, um, that you find in, in Java code. And then for each of these kinds of tokens, um, we are computing a metric um, called distance from uniformity, which I won't explain in, in full detail, but basically it gives you um, a number that, um, um, yeah, the higher it is, the more um, um, attention um, is paid to a particular kind of token compared to a situation where you would just pay uniform attention to all to all tokens. So if this distance from uniformity is zero, it means that this kind of token gets exactly the kind of attention you would expect if all tokens would get the same attention. Minus one would mean no attention at all, and uh, and uh, is, uh, yeah, any value between minus one and one means um, less attention than you might expect. Whereas a value larger than zero means more than uh, uniform attention. So now with this um, metric in mind, let's um, have a look at the results. Um, now this is again a, um, a plot from code summarization. And um, what you see here is for the different kinds of tokens, so identifiers, separators, keywords, and so on, the um, distance from uniformity for the humans and for different kinds of models. So any, any of these bars that goes more toward the right means a lot of attention is paid to this kind of token, and anything that goes to the left means less attention than you might expect is paid to this kind of token. And then the different colors um, are the different models, and green um, are the humans. So for example, what you can see here is that um, the humans pay quite a lot of attention to identifiers and also operators, but not a lot of attention to separators. And um, in, in contrast, for example, the, uh, um, the model, the transformer-based summarization model, when, it, when we look at its regular attention, pays a lot of attention to, to separators, which is very different from what the humans are doing. Now, um, um, yeah, let, let me um, to let me show you a concrete example to um, to to see why this happens. And this is actually from the uh, transformer-based summarization model that I've um, just just talked about. So on the top, you see um, the regular attention that this uh, transformer-based model um, pays, and on the bottom, you see the human attention record um, for exactly the same um, piece of code. And even by just uh, looking at it very quickly, what you can see is that the two are very, very different, right? So the, the, the kinds of tokens that the models and the humans look at um, yeah, are, are very different. Um, and in particular, what you see is that um, yeah, the model pays a lot of attention to, um, to tokens that arguably are just about understanding the syntax of the code. So it pays a lot of attention to semicolons, um, open parentheses, um, curly braces, this kind of thing. And the reason is, or at least we believe the reason is that um, the model is looking at the code as a sequence of tokens, 
So the first thing it needs to do is to kind of recover the syntax and 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 build something that is similar to maybe an AST um, to understand how this how this code is actually structured. So it needs to look at the semicolons to figure out where a statement ends, and it needs to look at the curly braces to figure out um, where a code block starts and end, ends. Just to jump in quickly, did you look at the different layers of the transformer at all? I think there's been some sort of research suggesting that. Uh, different layers of a transformer kind of stack mm -hmm. more attention to syntax, others to higher level kind of concepts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we did not look at the layers individually, but we just summarized the attention across all the layers. But yeah, it would be nice to 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 look uh, even even deeper and and look at different layers and maybe, I mean, may, maybe that some layers um, try to understand some aspect of the code and other layers try to understand some other aspect. Um, we, we didn't go that deeply also because every model is a little different. So it would make it much harder to 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 really use the same methodology on, on different on different models. Yeah, but yeah, great question. Um, so another observation um, that can be made from um, from this example is that the model ignores some tokens that apparently are really important to developers. So one example you can see here is um, string literals. So it seems that string literals are really important for the developers to figure out what the code is doing, but this model at least is not looking at them at all, right? So it's it's kind of not using a resource that apparently is, is useful for humans in order to solve this task, which of course, yeah, um, um, brings an obvious idea for for future work. So, so you could learn from what the humans look at, and then try to make the model also look at this part of the code in order to make it more effective. All right. So, talking about being effective, um, we also looked into how effective um, the models and the humans are at solving the two tasks we gave them. Um, and that allows us to understand what strengths and weaknesses um, the, the, the models have compared to, to human performance. Um, and of course, we can also check whether the current models, or at least those models that we studied here, can compete um, with the developers. So let's um, look at the results. And let's again start with code summarization. So what you see here is the F1 score, which is um, yeah, a measure of, of how how correct the answers um, for the code summarization task are. And you see the two models, the CNN-based model on the left, the transformer-based model in the middle, and then the humans um, on the right. And in order to, to better understand um, how well the models and the humans perform on particular kinds of methods, um, we, we categorized the methods a little bit. Um, so we separately looked at getters and setters. Um, which are yeah, what the name suggests. And then um, some, some other categories, um, one we call checkers, which is basically to, to check some Boolean property. Um, test, which is um, uh, to, to, inc well, to check some state of, of, the, um, of the program and other, basically everything else. And what you can see if you look at the results is that both models are really strong um, on the getters and setters, but are not that great on, um, on the other kinds of methods. Whereas for the humans, it's a bit more balanced. So they also are better on getters and setters because, well, those are really easy to, to find a name for. Um, but, they, but, 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 but the difference between the two um, groups of, of methods is, is not that strong. So, 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 so the, the, the high level takeaway here is that the models, at least those that we studied, underperform a bit compared to the humans um, once you go away from, from what we might call non-trivial methods. So basically everything beyond um, getters and setters. Uh, sorry, just a question. Could this be a result of the uh, fact that there are probably more getters and setters in the in the models for training? Um, uh, possibly, yes, possibly. I mean, we we, yeah. we of course average across. Um, in I mean, for, for, during prediction, we average the F one scores here. So, but but yes, if if during training the model sees a lot more getters and setters, then naturally it will be mm -hmm. better um, for okay. them. And one strategy to to basically. Um, improve the models might be to to basically do something like curriculum learning and and show the models mm -hmm. um, more of the harder methods um, after it has learned basically to, to to be good on getters and setters um, and that could actually bring them closer to to the humans yeah um, yeah and we're talking about Java code so there's probably a lot of getters and setters anyway mm -hmm. yes yes. Yeah I mean another takeaway from this is that maybe for for tasks like code summarization, 
get us and set us shouldn't even be part of the data set because because it's it's relatively easy to find um a good i mean it's obvious how you how you name them right um if there's a method that returns foo you probably want to call it get foo um so yeah michael what are the what are the gray bars capping each of the human bars oh yeah good question i didn't explain that so so for the humans um the task was to pick the right method name out of seven options and we designed the experiment such that one of these seven options is exactly the right one. Three are similar. So we, 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 we found different names that are semantically similar based on, on uh, learned token embeddings. And then other three are completely different because they're just randomly chosen from, 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 a, from a corpus of names. And if the human participant selects the correct one or one of the three that are semantically very similar to the correct one, we call it pseudo-correct. And this is what these are the dark bars that you see here. You, you're muted. Uh, I, I, I see you. Essentially, you had a you had a detractor in the set. You added a detractor. Exactly. Yeah. So this this tries to kind of account for the fact that we have three detractors among the, the seven possible answers. Yeah. You probably said this, so I'm sorry to ask it. But how much statistical power do we have here? How big is the corpus? Um, so for, for code summarization, we have uh, 91 participants and 1500 or 98 participants and 1500 um, attention records. And for so so for for the yeah in the paper we also have um, yeah more details on um, statistical significance um, and and all the all the, all the results that I reported earlier on comparing. Um, um, well, basically measuring agreement, we, we make sure that whatever we say in the paper is statistically significant. All right, let's um, move on uh, by looking at the effectiveness and how it compares between humans and um, the models for the program repair task. So what we um, did here is to, to basically measure the success rate. So if a human um, decides that um, he or she has found a, a, a fix um, and then um, selects in our interface um, that this should be the, the, the submitted um, edit. Then we say this is um, yeah, um, um, yeah, a, a suggested fix and we count how often um, this um, fix is a plausible patch where plausible patch means that it passes the test suite. And uh, similar for the model. So the model um, suggests um, a possible fix. And then um, um, we check whether this is actually um, the, a plausible uh, patch or not. So what you can see here is um, um, the two uh, repair models that we looked at, sequencer and recoder. And we check how many among the top five or top 100 um, suggested patches are plausible. And what you can see is that most of them are actually wrong. So, so the, the model guesses a lot of times um, before it actually finds um, the right patch. And the way this um, is, is accounted for in, in most of these repair tools is that um, it's basically uh, generate and validate. So you um, ask the model to generate a possible uh, patch and then validate it using um, a test suite. And only once the test suite passes, you report the patch to the developer. But if you just look at what the model um, is suggesting, um, you see that most of the suggestions um, are actually wrong. Um, in contrast, the humans, which you should be able to see now, um, have performed like this. Um, so, so this is averaged over um, uh, five to seven developers that have looked at the same bug. And here we looked at how many of the um, fixes that developers eventually submitted um, were plausible. And what you see is that almost 70% of them um, were plausible. So the developers in most of the cases are actually able to find the right fix at the first attempt, whereas the models need to be queried many, many times. And you need to have a test suite to validate which of the many um, predictions by the model are actually, um, are actually useful. So in this direct comparison, you can see that, or you can say that the models are relatively um, far away from, from human effectiveness, at least those that we looked at here. Um, so now looking at these results, you may wonder um, if it actually um, helps the models to be, um, um, well, to, to look at the same tokens that um, the developers looked at. Uh, we do not have a, I mean, a complete answer for this, but we, we have a partial answer. Um, by basically looking at whether the models are more effective when they agree more with the developers about the tokens to look at. Um, so what you see here now is um, 
the, the Spearman rank correlation, so the agreement between humans and models for different um, uh, subsets of the methods in, in the um, code summarization data set. So on the, in, the, in the middle column that, that, that is called all methods, you basically see um, the agreement um, by, by just considering the entire corpus of um, uh, test methods. Um, whereas on the, on the, in the right column, you see only those methods for which the F1 score is between 0 0.5. So basically those methods for which the model um, is better um, at, at finding the right name. And, and then if you look at the Spearman rank correlation values in the table, you see that the, the values are getting larger if you, if you go from the middle to the, to the right column, which essentially means that um, the model is better um, um, if there is a higher agreement um, um, about the tokens to, to look at. So, so we do not really know if there's causality, so, so that the statement that is here in yellow is a little bit overstated. So we um, do not know whether the predictions are more accurate because the um, because the attention is more human-like, but the data at, at least shows um, a correlation between these two, um, which suggests that if you would have models that are more human-like, um, th they are likely to be more um, effective. Good, so let me um, yeah, zoom out a little bit and think about um, the, the broader implications that um, this kind of work um, may have. So, so I think one, one high-level takeaway is that um, this direct comparison of humans and models is a really nice way to understand a little better why these models are working and what they are actually doing. So, so, uh, so, so, yeah, what I can recommend if you have some other task you're working on and maybe train some other models for them um, is to is to do this kind of comparison. You do not always have to do this this uh, full study as we did here, but sometimes it's just enough to basically put yourself into the position of the model and, and think about how you would solve the task and then compare this to what the model is doing and if possible, maybe use attention mechanism um, to, to do this. Another takeaway is that um, it's probably worthwhile to try to create models that more closely mimic what human developers are doing. So one possible way of doing this um, could be to use human attention records that you, for example, could get from our study while training the model. So, so, so there are papers in, in other domains um, that um, basically use existing attention records in, in order to tell the model during training what parts of the input to, to focus on. And um, the attention records that we have um, might be a good starting point to do something like that um, on code-related task, tasks. Um, another way to do this, so another way to bring models and humans um, more yeah, closely um, to each other is to uh, design models that specifically address some of the weaknesses that we observe when comparing the models with the humans. Um, so one example I mentioned earlier was this um, uh, understanding of string literals, which seems to be really important for, for humans, at least for the code summarization task, and seems to be not uh, really uh, leveraged by the models. And you could try to design a model by, by, um, by well, in order to make it more aware of, of these tokens um, so that the model eventually becomes more effective. Good, so in conclusion, um, yeah, I've presented this work um, on yeah, thinking like a developer. Um, yeah, I, I just talked about some takeaways, so, so I no need to repeat those, but just want to mention that there are two interesting things available for, for future research. One is this um, web interface for capturing human attention, which we have both for code inspection and code editing. So if you have another task that fits this, this overall pattern and want to uh, capture human attention, you could reuse that interface and, and we are happy to um, help with that. Um, and then we are also releasing or have released a data set of human attention records. So if you um, want to use them, for example, to train a model that um, has more human-like attention or for any other kind of purpose, um, yeah, you're um, very welcome to, to have a look at this. And with this, I'm at the end of my talk and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Michael. Um, yeah, of course, I mean, if you have a question, uh, feel free to raise your hand, come off mute, post it in the chat. Um, I've got a question, so I thought I might start. Um, what do you think about some of these approaches where you have the model itself explain its own thought process? Mm. So these large language models people have been using, I think the other call it chain of thought prompting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prompting where the model outputs its kind of reasoning steps. Do you yeah. think that could be an effective way to kind of understand what's going on inside these models? Yeah, yeah, I think to some extent, yes. I mean, these, these models are, are really interesting. Um, 
yeah, because they try to give us a glimpse into how they are reasoning about um, about a problem. Um, I think to really know whether this is what the model is thinking in quotes, um, you probably would need to look a little deeper. It, it could also be that the model has some some completely different way of of, of reasoning about reasoning about a problem, but because it has seen these explanations, these step by step explanations in the in the prompt. It, it knows that it should give an explanation. So it okay, comes up with some explanation, but maybe it actually solves the problem in a different way. Um, but but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's another interesting way to understand these models. And it, it would also be interesting, interesting to compare that way of looking at what a model is doing to humans, similar to what, what we did here, um, to, to, to check if the, the chain of thought is actually the same as what humans would do for the same task and the same input. I'd like to ask a, a, a couple of questions. Oh, sorry. What's the problem? Brad Bant, you. So um, the first question I have is, um, I'm not familiar with very many transformer architectures that use copy attention. So I was wondering what, which model, which transformer model exactly did you use? Um, let me go back to the, oh, actually I have a different slide that has the, the full reference to the paper. Um, Hmm. Okay, I thought I had a slide, but <laughs> I don't. Let, let me, yeah, let me go back to the slide. Um, so the the transformer based, actually, the two transformer based models. I no, actually, uh, yeah, I, I, there's at least one, which is the the the, um, the one for quote summarization um, that was at ACL 2020. Um, the, 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 the full reference is in the paper, but um, so but it, it does use a copy um, copy mechanism. Okay, um, cool. I'll, I'll I'll look in the paper and, and get that out. Um, the other question: there are two kinds of summarization, as you know, um, abstractive and extractive. Uh, and in the case of uh, like here, it's a we're a special case where we're doing extreme summarization, and so the copy attention is going to favor by definition, by, con by, by definition extractive. So are the names going to be just, they're gonna be agglutinations of tokens and subtokens, right? Extracted from the body? Uh, they don't have to be, right? So the, the copy attention um, is just one way how the model can, can, can produce these subtokens. And if it wants to, it can, it can copy from, from, from the method body, but it can also produce um, right. Any other token, as long as it's in the vocabulary um, or it has a way to express it, yeah. Sure, but the 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 um, one of your findings is that when they match the human more closely, it works better. So in the case that it's working better, we're going to see more uh, extractive, right? Than than abstractive. Mm. So. Anyway, it'd be cool if you might like did some deep dive mm -hmm. on the names from this point of view to yeah, see yeah. like whether whether the agglutinations like if you de if you sub tokenize them say using sentence piece or and then you look to see how many are 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 identical and how many are abstracted be super interesting I think mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's an interesting idea so we we haven't done this but you you could basically take our I mean all all, all the methods that um are in the in the test data set and 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 have a subset where everything is copied or could be copied from the method body and, and others where you need to come up with some new sub tokens um, and, and then compare how, how, how these two subsets of methods um, fare in terms of agreement between humans and models and also effectiveness. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. We haven't done it. But... I think that, that, that's an, a new experiment that is a like, in, you know, but I was thinking just over your existing data, you could just empirically look at what, how much, how many of the sub tokens are abstracted. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the so so the, the data set is old, right? It's 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 um it's it's from this uh, 2016 paper, and, and in principle, yeah, anyone can look at um how, how many how many of the tokens are, are identical to some that appear in the in the method body. But yeah, we, we could also do that. And um, the way that you evaluated humans by giving them like a, a set fixed set of choices, kinds of kind of restricts them from using from from doing abstractive uh, summarization. So it, it's a threat to construct validity for the experiment that I just proposed. Yeah, 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 that's a good point. I mean, the task slightly differs for for, for the code summarization task, because the, the, the model just 
can generate any 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 method name whereas for the humans we we say okay it's one out of seven um so it's a slightly different task the reason why we didn't give give like a free text input to the to the humans is that we thought the chance that they would find the right name um, is relatively small, but, but we haven't, I mean, this, this was, yeah, we, we haven't done a systematic experiment to, to, to prove this. Yeah. I'm just, I'm interested. The reason I suggested it is just, I'm interested. The human is more likely, I think, to do an abstractive summarization is my, mm -hmm. is a, is my hypothesis. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um. Andre. Yeah, I wonder uh, if the summarization task was, um, yeah, basically hindered by this multiple choice, because if I get such a multiple choice question, I might um, not even look at the whole program, but just look for clues, which would favor looking at strings and stuff like that, which I probably would not do if I were to analyze a program for what it's doing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I yeah, wonder yeah. if if this might skew the results on the human side. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a that's a valid point. Um, it's true that if you, I mean, and, and the the seven options are visible um, right from the beginning, right? So 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 a human could basically look at look at those and then just quickly go through the code to discard some of them and then and then and then just pick whatever remains. Um, and that's a little different from the task of really trying to understand what a method mm -hmm. is is doing yeah 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 that's a good point yeah because usually if i try to analyze what a program is doing i probably won't take a lot of time to look at the strings mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it depends a bit what what your what your ultimate goal is i mean if you would find if your goal is to find a name i think i mean at least me i think if i would have to to find a name um without having any options um, I would, I think the strings are still helpful because the strings, so for example, often they're error messages yeah. that tell you, oh, I failed to do this and this, and then you know, <laughs> okay, this and this is what the method is doing. Yeah, of course. But such heuristics are probably outside the scope of a model that is trained to summarize code. Well, if the model would look at the strings, I guess it would eventually find them to be useful, but, but, um, yeah, so somehow the models we looked at didn't really, yeah, exploit that piece of Perhaps information. Perhaps they didn't trust strings. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so we've got a question here uh, that, about the transformers. Uh, some, at least some of the transformer layers are learning kind of or tending to the syntax of the code. Um, might it make sense to free up capacity by adding syntax as an inductive bias to the model so it can focus on attending on a higher level? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a that, that's a that's a really good question. And uh, I mean, intuitively, I would say yes, but then the the the, the impressive power of these large scale language models somehow suggests a no, <laughs> because they do not get any information about the, about the structure of the code. They just see a sequence of tokens. And if, if they are trained on enough data, it still seems to work well. So so somehow um, my intuition and what, what the empirical results these days are showing um, diverge a little bit here. But but yeah, I mean, the, the idea of, of adding, of adding um, some information about the syntax and the structure of the code in order to free the model from, um, from having um, to figure it out itself, um, intuitively makes sense, yeah. Do you think that the results of this may be different if you had access to a, like a very large language model? Do you have any sense or do you sort of feel mm -hmm. like this relationship would hold if you say, you know, we're looking at the attention map of OpenAI's codex or something like mm -hmm, that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really hard to answer because I, I mean, I, I can only speculate. Um, would definitely be interesting to 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 run this kind of experiment and 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 now that we have the so detention records of the humans are all available right so 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 anyone who has access or, or i mean i think we could also do it ourselves with a um, with one of the freely available models um and then just compare on the same task to the human performance it would be interesting to do but uh, we haven't done it yet so i can i could only speculate but i think it doesn't help much <laughs> on what would be the result yeah, makes sense. Um, we've got a follow-up as well about the inductive bias question. Hard to judge uh, LLM plus fine tuning versus a model with inductive bias. Um, yeah. 
not quite sure what you mean by that. So okay. I'll come off mute for a bit. Uh, what I mean by that is with large language models, you pay a high cost at the very start. So you pay the original training to get the large mo model up and running, et cetera, et cetera. But then once you have it, they're very good zero shot or few shot learners. Mm -hmm. So now the sample complexity to tune it to your own task is reduced, but you still need that massive model to begin with. And then you want to compare that versus a from the start trained, but with inductive biases model on the same amount of samples, make a judgment whether one approach or the other is more reasonable, provided we're training the large language models anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very hard call to make whether it makes sense to add the biases or learn from just massive amounts of data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of course, of course, yeah. I mean, it's also, yeah, I mean, that goes a bit off topic, but yeah, it's, it's. I think that the full equation also needs to look at how much data you need, how, how, how much training time you, time you need, right? And then I, I feel like these specialized smaller models are still good for something. They're just not as general and... Um, and, and powerful for multiple different tasks as the large language models. Um, so I, I'm just reading your, your other question about program repair, where you ask how many executions did the developers need to obtain their answers? Um, so, so actually the human developers did not have the option to execute the code. So they for them, it was one, one attempt and then it's either correct or not. And even with this setup, they had almost six, uh, almost seventy percent of the of the of the repairs uh, correct or at least plausible. Um, whereas the models had this option of generate something, try to validate it, and if it doesn't doesn't pass the test, we'd go back and generate something else. This actually makes my thought experiment more difficult because now we're not comparing with humans actually executing, but humans will still have a mental model of execution, and they might execute in their mental model. Sure. and obtain an expectation of what the program might do. And we can't really measure that. So they still might have multiple runs or multiple samples as they're iterating internally, so to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this may also happen for the for, for, for some of the models, right? We don't really know how they how they reason about the code and, and yeah. I suspect so for chain of thought, but for simpler models, perhaps not. So again, it's also difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, Michael, you also mentioned in passing that um, it's pretty, I thought it was pretty interesting, this idea of learning from uh, kind of human attention. Mm -hmm. You have, kind of know what humans attend to, then trying to transfer that knowledge to a model. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned in some other domains, there have been some attempts to do that. Um, like, do you, maybe, do you mind sort of walking through like maybe how, like how they do that? Like, how do you go from one to the other? Let me try to remember that. So we have a reference to at least one paper that does that in, in our paper. Um, and I think what they did was to, to, to look at the attention map during training and to have as part of the loss, um, basically how close that attention map is to a human attention map. And then they were, in addition to the, to the usual loss, also trying to, to nudge the model into paying attention in a way that is similar to the to the human attention. Okay, so you have like almost like a human distribution of, mm -hmm. of, and then you sort of minimize the divergence or something like this. Exactly, yeah, something like that, yeah. Interesting. We have any other questions? We've got time for one more. I mean, I've got another question. <laughs> sure, go for it. Just kind of as a kind of just a general question. I mean, what do you think software engineers will be doing in five years' time? You know, what will that what will that job look like? <laughs> How many years did you say? Five. Five years' time. Oh, five. Uh, five years maybe not that different from today. Actually, I think um, um, because because the field is I mean it's moving fast, but maybe not that fast. But but probably there's a lot more powerful code completion and just saying oh yes, except except <laughs> going going on compared to what people are doing today. I mean I, I see it in my own coding right. I'm I'm, I'm using Copilot and and I. I, I follow the suggestions at least partially um, um, pretty often. Um, 
And then I think, yeah, these neural models are probably also taking over in some other tasks um, and, and they probably come in, in the disguise of, of a bot or, or some other human um, that in, in, in some form of interaction, like during code review or, or, or any other setup that is similar to that, um, where you can kind of sneak in some suggestions and make them look like they come from a human, but actually they are generated by a model. Yep. Um, okay, so not taking everybody's jobs. No, no, no. If that's the the answer you were looking for, I do not think this is going going to happen. <laughs> Are you worried about um, them? You know, you're you know you work at a university. You have students. Are you worried about students becoming kind of over reliant on these models, or are you worried about kind of plagiarism, or you know? Mm, I, I am, but but not to a much larger extent than I was before when people were basically copying and pasting code from Stack Overflow and other websites. So so I think it's just a, a more convenient way of doing it now. Um, but 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 the underlying problem is not that that new. And of course, people should not just rely on copy and pasting or, or following suggestions, right? If they do, um, yeah, ultimately, <laughs> that, that, that won't make them um, um, yeah better developers. Great. All right. So if there are no more questions, then I think we could wrap up. Yeah. Thanks a lot for for all the cool questions and for 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 coming by. Uh, thank you. That's been brilliant. Yeah. Um, yeah thank you for joining us.